This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, recording today Harry Potter style in a closet under the stairs. Today we're talking about a class mascot who makes every other class mascot look like small potatoes. All right, let's go. Speaking of potatoes, shout out to Danny in Alaska, who wrote in with a topic idea which I have been mulling over for quite some time. It's going to be a podcast episode in the future, so stay tuned, and I'll give Danny another shout out then. But in that note, they also dropped some potato fact bombs that led me down a weird rabbit hole. This is a little more planthropology territory, but I'm going to do my best. So go listen to the Planthropology podcast with Vikram Balega if you are more into this kind of fact knowledge bomb stuff. So Danny said, did you know that potatoes have 48 chromosomes and we only have 46? Well, the simple, unassuming potato has more building blocks of DNA than humans? I had no idea. So down I went down a little rabbit hole of tuber truth. The International Potato Center, yes, a real thing, has over 7,000 wild, native, not native, hybridized, all kinds of potatoes that they use for breeding and research and everything that you can imagine. Turns out a crop of potatoes can yield more than four times the food quantity of grain crops, and they produce more food per unit of water than any other major crop. Y'all, potatoes are up to seven times more efficient in using water than any other kind of like cereals and oats and grain and blah, blah, blah. So when things go wrong with potatoes, though, they go really wrong. Remember the Irish potato famine, anyone? So a fungus spread very rapidly through those crops in 1845, which killed about half of the potato crop. And for the next seven years, it killed over three quarters of the potatoes. But it wasn't just that farmers weren't able to make enough potatoes happen. The farmers basically had this whole potato currency that they had to pay their landlords and lords and king and all of these other people, fancy pants folk, politicians. So they had to make payments essentially in potato currency. So when the fungus came in and killed all the potatoes, by the time the farmers gave away what they had as part of the contract, they didn't have enough to eat themselves. Well, why didn't they just make another crop? Corn and wheat are just too expensive to produce. And so then the people started to die. Remember the All Newfoundland special? This was one of my favorite stories on this show to date. The name of the story was Anne Harvey, Harry Mann, and the Island of the Dead. In that story, I described how a ship of Irish immigrants were trying to make it to North America during the Irish potato famine. And they ended up in even a worse way after their boat crashed on Wreck Rock and were taken to the Island of the Dead to be saved. Little ominous. So go back and take another listen if you'd like. So thanks, Danny. I really, really loved your note, and we will do your topic soon. I promise. And if you have a topic idea, don't forget to drop me a line at bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. And before we start today's show, I'm going to have to go take a quick break for some french fries because those are potatoes, and now I'm hungry. I'll then have to brush my teeth because this closet and my breath need to be on the same page before recording. I'll be right back with the magic of editing. All right, let's get on with the show.
The juxtaposition of a full wall mural inside of a chain link fence at Elysian Heights Elementary School greeting the parents and staff and children in the run of the mill, no pets allowed on school ground signage hanging on that very same fence, is almost comical when you realize the cat painted on the wall nearly a full story and height lived at the school for 16 years. So leave it to a cat to just ignore signs and do whatever it wants. Elysian Heights sits in L.A. It's near where Dodger Stadium is, nestled between the 101 freeway and the 5 freeway. But in 1952, where our story takes place, this was just before the I-5 highway that borders the Elysian Heights neighborhood was constructed. A gray tabby cat just waltzed into the school like he owned the joint. He was skinny. He looked rough. He was not a kitten. He was also not supposed to be here in room 8. This is a school. But the skinny didn't last for long as the kids shared their lunches with him in the sixth grade classroom. As the weeks went on, the cat came every day to visit the kids at the Elysian Heights Elementary School. Eventually, an official cat feeder was selected to make sure the new mascot of the school was taken care of. This post, as you can imagine, held the highest honor, even more so than line leader. That's big news. Quote, I was lucky to be one of the sixth graders who got to feed the cat in the teacher's room every day, recalled former student Julie O'Neill Hines. We weren't allowed to have pets in my house, so a quick cuddle of room eight's fat furry body was always a welcome thing. As summer approached, the kids in the class went on summer break, and so too did the cat. Now officially called room eight, the room in which he had an affinity for. According to A Cat Called Room Eight, a book written by Beverly Mason, the school's former principal, and Virginia Finley, a teacher at the school, quote, no one knew where he went at night or during vacation. He disappeared like a ghost. Like the swallows of Capistrano, he returned every September for the opening of school to sleep on the desks of children. The minute school started, the day the first bell rang, down the street he'd come. On the first day of school, every newspaper and television station in town showed up at the crack of dawn to watch this cat appear from out of the hills. And as the kids came back on the first day of school in their new school clothes, headbands, sneakers that haven't been broken in yet, give it time, room eight would appear as he too had gone on a three-month vacation for a much-needed rest before advancing his learning when fall came around. There's a great photo of room eight. It's a black and white photo, a, a classroom of first graders dressed up for school as they did that in the 50s, all with their hands on their chests and their eyes on the American flag just off to the left of the photo. There's a teacher in the background by the door with her hand on her chest. And in the foreground is four desks all pushed together with a globe and a rotund tabby cat, nearly as round as the globe itself, out cold. At night, roommate would wander out only to return the next school day. I assume to finish his science fair project. Obviously, word got out about a cat who would just wander the halls without a hall pass, rest on kids' desks during math, and completely snore through the Pledge of Allegiance. The media absolutely showed up. Look Magazine published a three-page story on Room 8, a documentary called The World of Animals, Big Cats, Little Cats, which, according to IMDb, was written and directed by Bud Weiser. I thought this was a joke because, hey, I've been on the internet. But it turns out Budweiser was a real guy who wrote on real shows. Coach, Charles in Charge, he was also the supervising producer for Who's the Boss? None of these words make sense if you are under the age of 35, so I'm sorry about that, but for we geriatric millennials, Budweiser isn't a prank from Bart Simpson to Mo at the Tavern. He was real. I tried to find a copy of this documentary and was unsuccessful. There was one review, though, on the IMDb page for this Budweiser joint that was so good. I had to share it. This is a direct quote from the IMDb user, Chevdo. And it makes me really want to see this documentary even more. Quote, I really need to track down a copy of this production. I only caught the last 10 minutes of it at 4 a.m. on TV in the mid-1990s, but what I saw in those 10 minutes had me pine for a copy since then. There were all these stray cats in abandoned buildings, and Lauren Green is narrating an anthropomorphic tale of what each cat is supposedly experiencing, which is mostly a cat orgy. Then all of a sudden... Wrecking Ball smashes through the wall and cats go crazy. If you want to feel like Chevdo did watching this documentary, 
I think you could just read the rest of the reviews that he has on other movies. They are pretty great entertainment on their own. Anyway, as Room 8's popularity grew, he became certifiably famous. By 1962, the word got out about this frisky kitty. Typically, he'd receive about 30 letters a day from kids around the country. And at the height of his fame, the school was getting 100 letters a day addressed to the cat. The sheer number of letters that were coming into the school created an educational opportunity for 6th and 5th graders. They were basically contracted out to be Room 8's PR team. If you went to the school, you learned how to write a letter, said one of the children, who was looking back as an adult about this period of her life. The children answered each piece of mail and signed it with a little rubber stamp of Room 8's paw print. Much like the letters to Harry Potter that were addressed under the stairs, some letters addressed simply to the cat Los Angeles would make it to Elysian Heights correctly. Meanwhile, USPS keeps telling me I have my own address wrong. So how did so many people know about this little stray cat? Well, aside from magazine spreads, he was also featured on Art Linkletter's show House Party. And if you don't know who Art Linkletter is, you kinda do. He hosted a show called Kids Say the Darndest Things, something that has rather evolved into what Jimmy Kimmel does every year with kids in Halloween candy when parents say that they eat it all and then record their reactions. Some things you just don't kid about, and stealing children's candy is one of them. But Room 8 made appearances with the principal Beverly Mason at local cat shows and was made an honorary member of several organizations. He was also featured in local and national newspapers, cat magazines, and national publications for school children. And for 15 years, he never missed a day of school. That is something I cannot say personally. But as we all know with kids, visit to the doctor are excuse visits. Roommate was always accompanied by his friend Sam Ross. Sam Ross was the custodian of Elysian Heights. But he didn't have a good dental plan. Room 8 started to lose teeth, and then... He got into a serious cat fight in November of 1963. Perhaps he was defending the school. I mean, I'd like to think so. Three lives down, he then nearly died of pneumonia the following year. And yet he still made it front and center for the sixth grade class photo every single year. He was always held by the designated cat feeder, with the class president probably seething, eyes twitching. I want to hold the cat. After the near-death experience with pneumonia... Friends and neighbors pitched in to give Room 8 a place to stay, which some sources say he willingly went and others say he was more begrudging. Sam would carry him across the street to make sure he made it safely to the Nakano family for the night and for all the days the school was closed. But that Room 8 had other ideas. Sometimes he just needed to go on a walkabout first, so flashlight teams would then be deployed to find him. This cat was truly the community cat, and the community got behind this mascot as much as he got behind these kids. Often, crowds with flashlights would find roommate enjoying a nap in a neighbor's garden or visiting other neighbors for, you guessed it, a snack. He would always go back to his own school the next day, ready to assume his daily duties as the school mascot. But you're not really a beloved mascot until you have your paw prints embedded in wet cement, which is exactly what happened with Room 8. His paw prints were intentionally printed in the wet cement in front of the school on June 11, 1964. Room 8 was coaxed by his friend Sam, the custodian, and as he crossed the cement, which I'm sure felt very weird, he seemed to strut in front of the media's rolling cameras. His head and tail were held quite high. Those footprints, along with the words, Room 8, School Cat, still survive today, even though they are quite faded as all things do through time, including... The fame of the most famous cat in the world. It's been over 50 years since the spectacular famous cat faded, much like the sidewalk in front of the Elysian School has faded with time. As his fame grew, the school sold t-shirts with Room 8's likeness, which funded the school's library. It was 1968, 16 years after a scrawny tabby waltzed into the school. This was just a few months after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and James Earl Ray, his killer, was arrested four months later. The Civil Rights Act was signed, Bobby Kennedy decided to run for president and was later murdered, Saddam Hussein became vice chairman of the Revolutionary Council in Iraq. Hey, I wonder what happened to that guy? 60 Minutes debuted on TV and is still on the air today. Richard Nixon? 
won the presidency and threw some Vs. Led Zeppelin took to the stage for the very first time in England and later in Denver. And Star Trek got into some very hot water for showing a very hot scene, a kiss between Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura. The very first televised interracial kiss, and while all of this was going on, the Vietnam War, political protests, a fight for, and in many cases, unfortunately against, civil rights, a flu epidemic, and second wave feminism, all of this big, heavy stuff that the kids at the time knew was happening around them, but maybe not knew knew what was happening. But summer school was in session for the first time in a long time in Elysian Heights, California. And as always, Room 8 just had to keep an eye on things until he couldn't. His age had finally caught up to him. The ninth and last of his lives was hanging on by a thread, but was no match for the kidney failure that is so very common in cats even today. He was taken to the animal hospital, but without school keeping him going, without a tenth life, without youth of a younger cat. Room 8 passed away on August 13th, 1968. His death was not included in the Wikipedia article of the very big things I just read to you that happened in 1968 because, well, history is written by those who write it down. And we didn't have an internet in 1968. The very thing where cats thrive. The world's most famous cat. A cat who got over 10,000 fan letters in his lifetime. Kids whose hands cramped writing back to kids all over the country. Or kids who were heartbroken that they were line leader instead of cat feeder. They'd rather feed the cat. They might have just thought that's how school was for kids all over the country. What do you mean other schools don't have a stray cat just walk in and sleep on desks all day? Because when you're a kid, it's easy to assume things just happen to you must happen to everyone else. But when you get older, you realize that the cat who adopted the school was unusual. The school had a cat who used at least one life defending the school against another cat. How dare he walk into my school? These are my kids. These are my hallways. This is my principal. And these are my cheese sandwich scraps. Get out of here. It's not every school that has a cat who has a three-column obituary in the L.A. Times and is eulogized in the Christian Science Monitor and other publications all over the country. The day after his death, the Long Beach Press-Telegram printed, quote, The cat with the funny name is survived by pupils who have attended the Elysian Heights School since 1953, the year he decided to make the school his home and the children his mascots. After he died, the students wanted to honor him properly. Kids dream big, and when kids started to raise money for the memorial at the Los Angeles Pet Cemetery, their hopes came true. But like all things with Room 8, the financial response was so overwhelming that they were able to purchase a headstone for Room 8 that is larger than that of Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart's departed companion. The dog Petey from Little Rascals is buried nearby. This cemetery is a real who's who of who was in the animal kingdom. Room 8 had a three foot high headstone. That's bigger than some of the youngest students in the school. It's not every school that has a homeless cat who's buried next to the MGM lion. And according to the LAist, quote, the whole history of Hollywood celebrities has their pets in that cemetery. Yet that cat, That homeless cat who adopted a school has a bigger memorial than any of them. And to this day, his grave is still the most visited. The family who took him in when he started to get sick, the Nakanos, they laid a wreath during his service of roses and carnations and they were laid on his grave. They were said to be his favorite as he would often be seen sniffing these flowers in the gardens all around the school in the neighbor's gardens and probably where he was found with the flashlight brigades when he would sneak out past curfew. Murals and portraits. Yes, painted portraits. Those kind of portraits you see in museums. A mosaic mural in the library. Obviously, he's front and center. Black and white photos and more adorn the school grounds and walls and sidewalks everywhere. And for parents who are looking for a cat school, much like other parents look for art school or STEM schools, alternative schools... This school is perfect for the budding cat ladies and cat gentlemen. 
What happened after the memorial, the burial, the murals, and the eulogies? Well, the kids from the school made their first donations for a room eight bed at a local orthopedic hospital. The fundraising brought in over $10,000 at the time. That is almost $79,000 today. The bed and the fund are gone. But other things kept happening long after the cat passed away are still ongoing today. First, roommate was continuing to get letters well into the 1970s, and the kids continued to answer them. More animals were established on the school grounds for kids to care for and befriend, including a pony, goats, sheep, and chickens. And the sixth graders had to be responsible for all of them. The kids were so excited to become sixth graders so they could take on the responsibility of the animals. One former student wrote, It was such a great thing to have this just three miles from the center of Los Angeles. Remember, y'all, this is in a city near Dodger Stadium between two highways. In 1972, Hetty L. Perry, affectionately known as the Cat Lady of Pasadena, and her very patient husband, who was not named in any of the reading I did, fed and nursed and groomed and cared for all the homeless and injured cats in their house. This was clearly her calling. Either that or it was the toxoplasmosis speaking. Toxoplasmosis is a bacterial disease that makes you want to love cats, <laughs> which is the best side effect of all time. Anyway, in 1972, four years after the death of Room 8, Hetty created and named a cat foundation in his honor after just reading about him in a paper. She never met this cat. She just knew that he would be the mascot to help other homeless cats in the future. I know, Hetty, you're awesome. In 1980, a physical building was constructed for the cat rescue, and it still stands today. Room8cats.org. And you can find more about that physical structure and the cats that are still there who need homes at Room8cats.org. When Hetty died in 1996, I assume after her husband, because this next part would seem very off otherwise, she left everything to the kitties and the shelter. According to the website, quote, Room 8 is a private no-kill 501c3 nonprofit organization that depends entirely on donations to continue its work and fulfill its mission. Our no-cage environment provides a safe and caring home for approximately 85 cats awaiting adoption, as well as lifetime care for those who cannot be placed. The sidewalks still carry messages left by the kids who knew Room 8 60 years ago. Walking down the sidewalk is a passage through time, a testament of adoration and love for this beloved mascot. According to Paul Cudineris, a historian who specializes in visual culture and history of felines. Yo, that's a real job, y'all. Kids who love cats pay attention a historian who specializes in visual culture and the history of cats. Anyway, according to Paul, this sidewalk isn't just a sidewalk. It's a pathway through 16 years of love and devotion. So looking at it today, the juxtaposition of a full wall mural inside of a chain link fence at Elysian Heights Elementary School greeting the parents and staff and children in the run of the mill no pets allowed on school ground signage hanging on that very same fence is almost comical when you realize just how integral animals were. Specifically one animal, but all animals were to this school stuck between two highways just outside of Dodger Stadium in one of the largest cities in America. The most famous cat who is not so famous anymore is memorialized behind a fence and a no pets allowed sign hanging on the perimeter of the school's property. I'm going to part with this. Some notes from the sidewalk. Quote, without a name, to room eight he came to give our school the greatest of fame, Yolanda Gongora. He came to our room and sat on my table. I loved him, Amanda Prentice. Not only did he give a kingly dignity to the school, he gave it a soul and a library, Range Fisher. And that is the story of Roommate.
So thanks for joining me today on Bewilderbeasts. If you want more of this, these stories of history and science and curiosity, check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash bewilderbeasts. Bonus episodes are there for everyone at a dollar a month and extra goodies for those who support at higher levels. I love doing this show and you do get extra stuff if you support it too. So if there are topics that you'd be interested in hearing about on the podcast, if you know of any historical animals who changed the world or just the world of children in a small town or a big town, animals who helped humans or wacky animals in the news, please send them in. Bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at BewilderedPod, BewilderbeastPod on Facebook, and Bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from thegreatcat.org, latimes.com, atlasobscura.com, thedailybreeze.com, imdb.com, a Flickr account from Eric Friedel, a Los Angeles-based photographer who took the photos on the blog that I checked out for information and for some of the photos that I was describing within today's piece. Eric Friedel is a filmmaker, and you can see some of his work on YouTube. Link is in the show notes. And some facts on the potato. Thetimes.com.uk, history.com, and genetics, thetech.org. Oh, and one last potato fact, sweet potatoes? Not potatoes at all. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music provided by Pixabay and freesound.org. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and please, please, please share with your curious friends. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week. Bye.